today I'm going to talk to you about stuff we haven't published it yet. It's um, really just developed over the past year and a half or maybe not even quite that long in my group. Um, it's a project that has been done in collaboration with Tony Rebus and Dave Baltimore, um, but really led by my um, postdoc, Song Ming Pang, with help from Tony's student, Jesse Zaretsky, Michael Bethune from the Baltimore group, and Liz Holman and Xiaojie Ding from uh, my lab. And as a disclosure, um, they're not trying to commercialize it or anything, but at one of my companies, Isoplexus, I'll, I'll be mentioning a little bit of data from them that's at least tangentially related. OK, so um, I think uh, immuno cancer immunotherapy has become um, uh, probably the, almost the hottest topic in medicine over the past uh, couple of years. Um, and it's because, at least in a couple of cancers, um, particularly melanoma, but a couple of others, it has uh, emerged as um, at least a very powerful treatment and possibly even a cure. And the concept that the immune system can be harnessed to attack a cancer seems like it should be somewhat more general than just, immuno uh, just melanoma. And, um, and that has sparked a huge interest across all of oncology in trying to figure out how do we take uh, these concepts that we're learning from some of the uh, cancers where it's been successful and apply them to others. And so as a general rule, immunotherapy means either unmasking the tumor to the weaponry of the immune system, typically T cells, or engineering or somehow heightening the immune system's awareness of the cancer. And, um, and it all started probably, I think, you can trace it back to 1984, um, which was the first patient that uh, Steve Rosenberg successfully treated with IL-2, which basically just designed to promote T cell replication. Um, uh, also uh, pioneered by Rosenberg was the concept of adoptive cell transfer, where it has many variants. So this could be CAR T cells, which are T cells that are engineered to have effectively an antibody on their surface, a non-natural construct, or T cells with T cell receptors that are specific to tumor antigens, or just maybe T cells pulled out of a tumor and expanded and reintroduced back into the patient. And so this would be an example of promoting an, a, an immune response by just uh, multiplying the T cells. This would be an example of more or less engineering an immune response. And then um, what I think really uh, caused the field to explode was this idea that was first put forth by Jim Allison with his um, uh, CTLA-4 therapy, but recognizing that oftentimes these T cell tumor interactions will get shut down by what are called checkpoints. And coming in and blocking some of these checkpoints exposes the, immune, uh, uh, the tumor to the immune system. And PD-1, which was, uh, this trial was run by uh, my colleague Tony Rebus, um, you know, uh, really, really exploded this whole field. And um, so, at, so at the heart of this are the T cells that actually recognize and kill the tumor cells. And, um, and in fact, it's been, um, it was shown a couple of years ago by um, Tony when he was looking at patients who had responded during his PD-1 trial that the presence of CD8 T cells in the tumors, these dark cells here in the tumors, um, prior to the therapy was predictive of response to the therapy. And more or less a baseline immune response. If I, OK. And it turns out, this is in the uh, uh, data. I'll describe a little bit what it is. But T cells, basically, they just want to kill. And they get inside a tumor, and they can get turned off. But once you block these checkpoints with something like PD, PD-1 in this case, anti-PD-1, um, you just, basically, you unleash these T cells. Um, uh, and, uh, and they start killing. 
And so this is uh, data that was taken uh, by Isoplexus, but using the technology that was developed in my lab over the past um, a decade or so, where um, individual T cells were taken out of this tumor uh, both before and after PD-1. And, um, and then for each of these individual C T, T cells, this panel of, a, say, 20 or so immune-associated defector functions was, was measured. These are just proteins that are secreted, and the secretion is directly measured. Um, and this is um, prior to therapy, and this is after therapy. And this axis here, um, what we found a couple years ago was that those T cells that secrete the largest numbers of different proteins also secrete, by something like a factor of 100, the largest abundances of any given protein. And so there's a polyfunctional strength index, which is just a single metric that describes how effective the T cell response is. And that's what this y-axis is here. And you're looking at something like a 20 or 30-fold increase in that polyfunctional strength index just upon releasing that, that PD-1 interaction. OK, so when these guys are in the tumor to begin with, there is, um, uh, even if they're not doing anything, and if they just went in there and, and obviously the tumor is growing, which is why the patient is, is being treated, um, there's something that must have drawn them into the tumor. And, um, and there's a lot of clues about that. In fact, it's, it's emerged as one of the most, you know, if, the, if these T cells are the drug, then you would like to understand everything you possibly can about those T cells. And what's drawing them into the tumor is a, um, a very, very um, key, key, key question to address. And it turns out that if we just simplify everything, so we have a T cell and, a, and, a, and a, uh, an antigen-presenting cell, which could be a tumor cell or a dendritic cell or something else inside the tumor, it's this antigen that is recognized by that T cell receptor that is drawing these T cells into the tumor. And the reason why these are interesting is not just because it, it is what's promoting this T cell interaction, but if you can actually identify the genes for these T cell receptors that recognize a tumor-specific antigen, meaning an antigen that is only in the tumor and not in healthy tissue, or you can identify what these little antigens are, which are just basically uh, 9 to 20 more peptide fragments of proteins that are in this, in this, uh, just chopped up as a routine process of how the cells operate, um, then the T cell receptors can form the basis of a cell-based therapy because you can genetically engineer those into T cells and, and you have an anti-tumor T cell. Or the antigens themselves, if they're unique to cancer cells, can become the basis for a cancer vaccine. And you can get a clue as to what these antigens are that are most effective by looking at the tumors that um, respond best to immunotherapy. And so this is, um, you know, we've had for now the past decade or so an ongoing effort called the Cancer uh, Genome Atlas to basically get the sequences of many, many tumors. And this represents a compilation of much of that data. And so what you're looking at here is on this axis, this is the mutational density, um, number of mutations per million base pairs expressed of DNA. And so you're sitting down there at, at as low as uh, uh, 0.1 or so, all the way up to 10. And over here are things like melanoma, which are the most um, uh, uh, highly mutated tumors, at least in advanced stages. And they're the ones that respond best to immunotherapy. So what that implies is that something about these mutations are drawing the T cells in. And, um, and that makes sense because typically a T cell is not going to attack self unless it's an autoimmune disorder. And, um, and so it's, it's actually being drawn in by uh, mutated fragments from those mutated proteins from that unstable, genetically unstable tumor. So this would be an example of a just a, a uh, it's just a random protein that I, I, I get the structure of, and you might have a mutation right here. Uh, 
during the course of, of just cellular processing, this mutation uh, fragment, this mutative fragment, can get digested by trypsin or something like that. And it can get expressed in the cleft of a major histocompatibility complex and displayed for T cells to sample. And the interesting thing about this particular antigen here, which is called a neoantigen because it contains that mutation, it is not self. And so by definition, it's something the immune system wants to get rid of. And in fact, these neoantigens have been um, a subject of, of you know, recent reviews in science. There's just, they're probably the hottest little molecules out there in cancer therapy right now for good reason. So I'm going to talk about um, identifying what neoantigens are inside a tumor and are drawing T cells in and, um, and the nature of those T cells. And I'm going to do it by analyzing, I'll uh, talk about the technologies for doing that, and I'll talk about um, a couple of patients. This patient in particular, I'll talk about analyzing them from both blood and from the tissue. So this is a, um, a patient uh, that presented with metastatic melanoma and had failed uh, virtually um, everything out there um, and then was started on anti-PD-1 uh, in 2012, right about the time when this um, uh, drug was, was released. And the drug's given at a, um, a, a baseline in September. There's about a, a three-month time period where nothing happens. And then the tumors just begin to, to melt away. And so during the course of this, of this therapy, it's obviously um, T cells are coming into this tumor and killing it. And that's what we want to understand. And if you look at... The, um, uh, the biopsy that was taken, I think this biopsy was taken just before treatment. Um, this is just a staining of this tissue. And you can see that there are, at this invasive margin of the tumor, there is um, uh, an abundance in this green color of these CD8 T cells. So this is a patient that, um, based on retrospective analysis of this and other patients, one would have anticipated would be a good responder to this therapy. OK, so neoantigens, how do we identify them? Um, you actually just have to start off with the entire exome, the entire, uh, basically the expressed part of the genome of the patient. And, um, and so if one thinks about mining this information, and I, I mentioned that you might have T cell-based therapies or you might have um, uh, types of vaccines, it's the only therapy concept I know of that actually relies on the entire genome of the patient. And so intellectually, it's turned into a very, very interesting challenge to try to, try to take advantage of this. And so you take the, um, the whole um, uh, uh, exome of the tumor. Uh, you compare it against the healthy exome. You identify the mutated proteins. You filter that through RNA sequencing and, um, to find out which ones of these uh, mutated proteins are actually expressed. And then you put, run it through binding algorithms, which go back to this, the strength of that uh, antigen binding into that MHC molecule. And so this is an example of one of these binding algorithms. Here's a, the wild type uh, uh, antigen. There's the mutated neoantigen there. And if you just digest this protein at all different points here, and you look at the affinity, you find that you've got kind of lousy affinities, but down here, you have a neoantigen that has a very, very strong affinity. And that goes on to the list of a candidate neoantigen. And so you will end up rank ordering these in terms of how strongly the antigen, the neoantigen, and the MHC molecule bind. A strong binder is something that's going to be below 50 nanomolars. A weak binder is going to be something below uh, half a micromolar or a micromolar or so. Um, and so this is just a, more of the analysis, um, uh, identifying the, 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 the mutation, identifying uh, what's being um, produced in terms of being expressed, and so on and so forth. And you get a list. And so I've, um, in this list here, the only information I provided is the binding affinity, 
the, the, the neoantigen with the um, particular mutation is highlighted in red here. And you would call this list, this side of the list, mostly the strong binding neoantigens. And this one would be the ones that are, are more weakly binding. OK? And uh, like I say, this is just a computational analysis. And this is what you'd say putative. I didn't know what putative meant. I should know that. I was an English major at some point in my life. <laughs> it means possible or candidate. OK? Um, all right. So there's a couple of existing methods that have been developed to try to identify which of these neoantigens are actually drawing T cells into the tumor. Uh, this is the one that's been used most commonly. And basically, you take one of these um, neoantigens and you just make an artificial gene where that neoantigen just get expressed inside, a, say, a dendritic cell. And you present that dendritic cell to tumor infiltrated lymphocytes, basically these cells that are collected from the patient's tumor. And if they light up in a lie spot assay with interferon gamma, that means that that particular neoantigen was present. OK? It doesn't tell you exactly which T cells recognize these neoantigens. And, um, and you can't, it's not particularly quantitative, but it actually is very effective for identifying which from this list um, uh, will, um, is, 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 uh, is, is recruiting T cells into the tumor. The second approach, which is a more of a, I would say, a high-tech approach and a little higher throughput, was developed by Tone Shoemaker and um, first reported in 2009 and then um, uh, advanced a, a couple of years later. And here you take this, this is the MHC molecule with this, this is the neoantigen peptide. And you put a biotin on it, and you assemble it as a tetramer. This is called tetramer staining. This is common in all of um, assorting T cell populations. The, the only difference is that you have this neoantigen here. And you use the, those to actually sort out cells from the tumor. The challenge is that this is a really long list. I've only shown the top 27 here. And uh, multicolor flow cytometry doesn't have many colors associated with it. And so you multiplex it via um, putting multiple dyes on each one of these tetramers. And so that allows you with, say, five different dyes to do something like a 25-element tetramer library. It has a multiplex, and that doesn't scale terrifically well, but it scales OK. And, um, and so we applied this method to the analysis of T cells collected from uh, that patient that I showed you, patient HM. Um, during the response period, um, and this is the, the matrix of, of, of dyes, the neoantigen identities are these numbers, and, and it's a kind of a, a complicated process, but I'll just draw your attention right here that this particular neoantigen um, was recognized by this, by this process. And so this process has typically been used to, it, it looks like it's quantitative, because you can actually identify which, how many T cells are associated with each neoantigen. But it doesn't come up with a very big number of neoantigen-specific T cells in the tumor, which makes you think that either neoantigens aren't that important or that the method is just not sensitive enough. And I think the consensus is that the method is not particularly sensitive. So this is a technology we developed in my group to address the same question. And, um, and so this is your your um, major histocompatibility molecule. And it's initially loaded up with an invention from Tone Shoemaker's group, which is called a, a conditional peptide. So when you make this MAC molecule, it'll, it'll just fall apart unless it has a peptide stuck into it. So you, you load it up with this guy. But this has the beauty that you shine light on it, and this peptide falls apart. And if you do it in abundance of a neoantigen that will bind in here, then you can load up the neoantigen. So what that means is that I can make one batch of this, I can turn it into a whole bunch of little vials and quickly make a whole library, OK? And then we take this streptavidin here. And by some gift of the god, streptavidin has no native cysteines on it. And so you can actually just engineer cysteines exactly where you want them and specifically put DNA labels onto these corners away from these biotin binding sites where you assemble this, this tetramer. And then we append that 
to these magnetic nanoparticles that have a, a barcode, a DNA barcode on them. And I'll show you how this is read out in a minute. But once you've done that, then you have every neoantigen is associated with a particular barcode. And then we can mix the entire library together and just use that with a magnetic feed to pull the T cells out of the tumor or out of the blood. And so the way this, this works, this is just with a, a set of cells called, um, uh, just a, a single type of, they're called MART1 cells, is that you, um, you put in a fluorophore that reads a one of three colors on this first position. And in this case, it'd be, we read a red. And then you displace that fluorophore through DNA hybridization. It all goes dark. You read the second spot. You see a green. It goes dark when you displace a third spot. And so I have a red, a green, and a yellow. And if you look over at this list of 27, I went red to green to yellow. And so with just three reads and three colors, I see 27 library size. And if I have four reads and four colors, it's 256. And you're never going to want to go bigger than that. Well, I don't know. Bill Gates once said you didn't need more than like 64K of memory. <laughs> and so you might want more than that. But, but right now, we, we can't imagine why you'd want more than that. OK, so uh, just initially some numbers. So when we, when we make one of these libraries, just the top 27 of these neoantigens, um, we pull out roughly about 5% of the cells from the tumor. That's what these big bars are. These little bars are measurements of non-selective um, uh, pull down. Um, we do a, this is a separate patient. So these are just two separate studies of one patient. This is a separate patient. We get the same number. And when we look in blood, we find that the, um, co the counts of these T cells, they're there. They're about a factor of 10 lower abundance. Um, but they're there. Okay. So now, to read this, to read out what the, what the antigen specificities are, we have a really simple microfluidic chip. So this is not the chip. This is just a picture I found on the web. But the chip looks like this. It's really, really simple. Okay, And it just has an input and an output. And each of these little channels here has these, uh, 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 a set of chambers on them, so like 60 chambers on this chip. And each of these chambers then, has 10 little cell traps. And so you flow, you precipitate your T cells, you flow them through the traps, and then, you, um, and then this allows you to read them out. So this is an example of one of these traps. And these T cells that are trapped in here, they look all hairy because they're coated with these magnetic nanoparticles. And you do a series of reads. And so if you look at like number one here, it goes from red to green to yellow red to green to yellow, and one and four. There's another one up here. These two I've highlighted because one of them just gets washed away. The other one gives you a nonsense read. And so you actually get a very, very clean read on these systems. You can tell a non-selective T cell, but you get very, very good annotation of what these T cells are seeing. And so here's an example of analyzing this particular patient. And, um, and what we see is not just one. This is the one that was seen with, um, with the flow cytometry method. But we actually see almost a third of all the putative neoantigens is represented here in, in, in the T cells that are taken from the tumor, um, including some that are um, relatively weak binding out here. And so what you're, the, the green and the red here are just two measurements that were done about a, a, a couple weeks apart to show the independence that we are able to validate this, this process pretty well. OK, so when we do this process, we don't actually destroy the T cells. They're fine. And so you can recapture them. And I think there's a lot of things you can do with them. But one simple thing you can do with them is just sequence the T cell receptor. And I would say that that's not exactly simple. But um, so I was talking to Lee this morning about this company in China that's going to have us had the ability to do an entire genome sequence for like $400. That does not include the T cell receptor gene. The T cell receptor gene is, is the single hardest gene to sequence. It's because it's, it, it does, you know, for those of you who know immunology, it has this VDJ re, uh, recombination. You have to take like 60 guesses at what the T cell receptor gene is going to look like. So it's not a high yield process, but you can sequence it. And, um, and this is what we've been doing with David Baltimore's group. And then you can clone it, and you can show that it comes back and recognizes the right element. 
So you close the loop, basically. You identify a T cell, you clone that T cell receptor, and you identify that it goes back and recognizes the neoantigen that you initially thought it would. OK. And it turns out you can see these same populations in blood. Blood turns out to be a very, a very powerful window into what's in the tumor. And so this is that same analysis. We just put a noise cutoff here at three. But of all that, so these were expanded T cells from the tumor. And we don't need to expand them for our analysis. But right now, such T cells are a pretty valuable commodity. And so you can't just mow through that such samples. But blood is not. We can actually look at a lot of blood samples. And, um, and so of the ones that we see in the blood, um, seven of the eight that we see in the blood are seen in these expanded T cells. This is probably a more honest representation of what's in the tumor, albeit with the noise cut off, because there's no expansion here. And so when you expand T cells, you don't know if you're screwing the population or not. And so, so let's think about what this means. So first, it means that blood turns into a very powerful window um, for this. But also, these abundant ones are the ones that one would want to think about using as perhaps a vaccine. And so if you want to design a vaccine for this patient, this patient doesn't need a vaccine because this patient was responding. But this is how you would, how you would define that. And, and the, the, the T cell receptor gene is how you would define the cell-based therapy. Um, and so we have this. Um, the one thing that was limiting us uh, on these analyses is that that little simple microchip I showed you was not a very efficient capturing device for the cells. So I don't know if you can see this, but this is a, a, a chip we've made. Uh, actually, our, our collaborators in Korea made it. And this captures now 95% of the cells that we pass through. It's a very, I, I just love these movies because you can just sit and watch them. But here's the T cells coming up. And you'll see they just, they just get sucked into these little channels as they come up. And then once this little row gets filled, they go around to the next row and they get filled. And so you have very easy solution phase exchange here. So you can do all the readouts you want to do, um, but you have much, much higher efficiency capture. Harder to recover the cells for TCR sequencing. But um, that's not necessary when you're doing like a kinetic series out of blood. OK, so if you do some math here, um, so for these neoantigen specific T cells from the patients that we looked at, if you go to the top 55 elements of that library and just fish, you find that about 7 to 8% of the CD8 cells in the T cell in the tumor are in that group. Okay? Now that's for one MHC genotype. And most patients will have four or five different MHC genotypes, maybe six. And so, and they should be equally represented. We don't know that for sure, but they should be equally represented. And so that tells you that these neoantigen specific T cell populations are roughly half of what's in the tumor. It is, it is overwhelmingly the strongest anti-cancer drug there is. This is why these people are, are doing well. And that finding is reproducible, at least in these melanoma patients responding to PD-1 checkpoint inhibitors. The same populations are detected in the blood. For sure, this is going to be a good biomarker of therapeutic response or failure. But maybe even more importantly, it means that with liquid biopsies, one can start doing some of this definition as opposed to having to do a, a surgical biopsy to identify vaccines or what have you. Um, CD4 cells also seem to play a strong role here. That's not been quantitated. That's a challenge that I think needs to be addressed in the near future. Um, the other thing that I think is important is that we're seeing lots of these neoantigen T cell populations. And, but we're looking at the easiest cases, which is you know, way on the right-hand side of this. But even if we dropped our numbers that we're seeing by a factor of 5 or 10, we're still going to see a couple of these populations. And that allows us to begin thinking about how one can extend these kind of neoantigen-based concepts down to lower mutational burden tumors, such as prostate cancer or breast cancer, or almost anything on this list. And, um, and I think that that's probably the most exciting intellectual challenge. I don't know if it's possible to do that, but it's a, it's a really interesting thing to think about, to take in, you know, the glioblastoma starts off way back here. Once you give these patients timazolamide, they move 
way up here, they get mute. But, but you know, in, in relatively early stage tumors, is it possible to make this an effective, an effective therapy? I don't know the answer to that, but I think it's one of the um, most exciting questions to, um, to ask. And with that, I will conclude, and I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs> yes? So, Jim, is a good strategy to uh, actively induce mutation to move low mutational to high mutational so that they can have field antigens? And, I mean, I recognize. Yeah, that's a two edged sword, right? It's a two edged sword. I, I, I think that there's a consensus that that's one of the reasons. I mean, you know, most of these, like these guys that fail everything, that there has been a, an inducement of mutations in these tumors, and it's one reason why they respond so favorably. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I think if you want to look at a tumor like GBM, you know, a late stage GBM, you'd have a better chance of success than, than early than stage GBM. Stage. But I, I don't know. It's a scary thing to think about to try to to try to do that. Yes. Yeah. Um, oh, hi. Hi over here. Oh, um, okay. I'm curious. I'm I, I do a lot of data analysis. I'm really curious about your uh, uh, how you an an analyze your uh, barcoding system for your RNA plex. Like, what type of system do you use to do that? So you mean, how did we decide yeah, upon the neoantigen like list, or how do we just how do we look do the barcode reading? Yeah, how do you do the like the data analysis for the barcoding? Well, so that's pretty simple. So we just flow through um, uh, these these uh, um, go back and, and show these. Okay, um, show this picture here. So so each one so position one can be red or green or yellow or blue, depends on whether it's fourplex or threeplex, and we just have complementary DNAs with fluorophores on them. And so it's all just imaging. So that process is very, very fast. Deciding upon what this library is, is a little more involved, and there's a lot of um, groups now working on trying to come up with better um, neoantigen prediction libraries. They're very data starved. I think the kind of data we're generating is going to help make those libraries, make those algorithms better. Um, anyway, but this process is, is simple. You just look at it, basically. Yes? Yeah, can you go back a, a slide or two? You uh, keep going back. There's a chart I wanted, I had a question for you on. Right here. This chart. Why do you think there's a leg? In the in this days of therapy, here on the far on the bottom left, why is there a lag? What is? Do you know what's going on there? So I think the initial. I can I can give you an answer based on other immunotherapies that I've been involved with. So before, when immunotherapy was a backwater and wasn't working. We were doing analysis of patients where you engineered T cell receptors to recognize tumor antigens, not mutated antigens. They were still self antigens, but they're tumor antigens. And you put those in the patient. And what you found is that you gave them is one very specific T cell with a specific T cell receptor. What you found is over time, many T cell populations that were anti tumor emerged. You had what's called epitope spreading. And so, in other words, your initial therapy only catalyzed a tumor killing. And then your immune system takes that to more robust levels. So I'm guessing you don't have very many T cells in the tumor when this starts. You have some, but not many. And you release that checkpoint. And now you've got to kill some cells. You've got to put a new antigen. You've got to generate new T cell populations. And I'm guessing that that's yes. okay. that time lag, which is actually kind of seen a lot. OK. Just kind of curious. Uh, actually, I had two questions. So <laughs> you can only you can only ask one. You've got to oh, prioritize. Okay, so so I'll ask the the second one then. Um, if uh, sixty four kilobases of memory is not enough, um, would you think about doing this with sequencing as a readout instead of hybridization, where you could do unlimited 
uh, libraries in terms of number? Yeah, if you could, um, we thought about that. And, and the, the advantage of this method is it is such a clean read. And when we put up, you know, when I put up these charts, I put up numbers per 1,000 T cells. But that's because we only measured 1,000 T cells. And so that's actually the, we saw 10 of these guys, which is statistically significant because it's a good read. And I think with, you know, with, with PCR processes, it might get, you might be sacrificing some of that, and you might have a, a little less of a, of a linear representation of what you're actually capturing. But it's a valid thing. It's a valid thing to think about. And you know, if you want to go to phosphoeptopes and other stuff like that, you can actually fill up a 256 library pretty, pretty quickly. Thanks.